Hi, Virginia. Thank you so much for joining. Hi. Hello. <laughs> so, Virginia, what condition were you born with? Epileptic left heart syndrome. Okay. And what was the journey like when you were younger to having that diagnosis? Well, actually, the journey didn't start. Well, I guess you can say the journey started early, but we didn't find out till I was three years old that that's what I had. I had gotten really, really sick. Well, I had been sick, and I guess my parents were just at a loss to, you know, with the doctors to see because no one could figure out what was going on. So finally, they had a friend who had children who also had heart conditions and said in our same town and said, you know, you need to go and see this doctor. And she was really good friends with the doctor. So she set up an appointment for my mother. And that's when they find out that I was very sick. And it started, you know, emergency surgery from there and see how I, that would go. So I had my first surgery with the shunt at three years old after they had found out what was going on with me. So and I guess from then on, you know, things were going pretty good. And then around the age of 12 is when the, they were having a new procedure, the Fontan procedure. And um, the doctor said, you know, you look for a good candidate for this. So, you know, the doctor said, would you like to do it? You know, we would like to, you know, this would actually potentially help you. So we were, my parents were kind of debating, but it was a 50-50, you know, at that point, maybe less. But we decided to go ahead and do it. So at 12, I had my second, and that was my Fontan. And that's all I've had so far. So, Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, I always thought with hypoplastic left heart syndrome that you have a lot of, of surgeries. So for you, it was just two? So far, it's just two. Yeah. Um, it's been, I like to, I'm very big on my faith. So I like to say it's by the grace of God that I'm still here and I've been doing as good as I have because the doctors are always amazed when they see me. So yeah, that's that's definitely why. <laughs> and how old are you now? I'm 46. And doctors said when you were younger that you probably wouldn't make it past what age? Um, it started off at five, then, you know, we don't know, maybe 10. And then, you know, maybe we don't know, you know, it could be, you know, a couple more years or whatever, but just kept going and going. So they've stopped telling me. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, exactly. How was that growing up with that? Like, what was that a conversation that happened pretty regularly of like, oh, maybe 10 more years, like just having that conversation open with. Yeah, with I think doctor. what, I think what really, I think maybe I didn't realize how serious maybe it was because I guess when I was younger, I guess the doctors only told my parents and never really had that conversation with me, I guess, maybe for my sake to not worry me. Mm -hmm. So I think it was always behind my parents' head. But other than that, I never really knew that was my life expectancy growing up, you know. So pretty much the doctors told my mom and my, my dad, you know, let her, let her live as normal a life as possible. You know, let her do chores, let her wash dishes, let her sweep, you know, up to her, you know, to where she can handle it, you know. So that's what I did, you know, so, you know, never really was limited, of course, with sports, never played sports or anything like that, but I was in band in school, you know, I played the guitar and stuff like that, you know, so pretty much normal life as much as, as much normal as it, it could be for me, so. Sure. So what does exercise look for you right now? Like how far can you push yourself? I try to push myself. It's mostly, I walking, you know, pretty much when I, when I, I'm very bad about exercising and I know I need to be better. But <laughs> <Me too. laughs> so when I do, I try the walking. I have this program, it's called the walk at home. So I do that. It has like different levels of walking. So I try to get through the whole 30 minutes and sometimes I do pretty good. Sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't do it anymore. But that's what I try to do. But for some reason, you can't tell when I do my stress test because I totally bomb those. So I don't know. <laughs> That's interesting. Maybe it's the incline. Do, do, I think it's the incline. Either that or it's that darn stuff they put on your face that kind of makes you claustrophobic a little. So so for my stress tests, they've never put anything on my face. Do they? What do they put? Is it oxygen? It's kind of like a mask that goes right here and they tighten it, you know, and you have like a little tube going out and I guess it tests your oxygen levels. So that's kind of makes it hard to breathe. So you kind of get to a point to where you're 
trying to get breath, but it's kind of hard because you have that thing on your face. So I think that's why I can't get past, you know, what I could. Yeah, because it's, it's a constriction and you're like, I'm just yeah. walking. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> While you were growing up, did the conversation of or your thoughts around having kids, where were your thoughts about that? Well, when I turned about, I guess, 14, 15, when I became a teenager, that was a conversation that my doctor did have with me and said, you know, if you get, when you, when you get married and stuff, you know, you won't be able to have kids just because it's way too, you know, it's going to be too strange in your heart and it's too much of a risk. So they recommended that when I did get married, that I wouldn't go have tubal ligation. So that was always in the back of my head, but for some reason, it just didn't feel right to me. You know, I just kind of, you know, said, yeah, well, you know, they've told me many things and, you know, I love my doctors because they, they tell you what, you know, what they know. So, but it kind of didn't, you know, I mean, I've been told, you're not going to live past the, this age and I've made it this far. So, you know, I'm not going to let, I kind of like, I guess, push the limits, I guess. So when that, when I finally did, I got married young. Um, I was 19 when I got married. So um, for a long time, you know, we, we knew, okay, no kids, no kids. And I was supposed to have a tubal ligation, like maybe four or five months after I got married, but I was there at the doctor getting ready to sign the papers. And, you know, I didn't feel, I didn't, it didn't feel right to me. So I said, no, I'm not going to do it right now. I'm just, I'm just going to wait and see what happens. Well, five years later, you know, I ended up getting pregnant. And of course it wasn't planned, you know, and it was probably more my, I should have known better kind of thing, but it was like, you know what, if this is what God wants, then this is what, what it wants and I'm not gonna you know do anything different so I we just prayed about it every every day you know and when I got pregnant and of course I was scared very scared so and I it took me about a month to my parents because I know my mom was gonna you know get so worried and she was so I had gone to my doctor and told him you know I'm pregnant and he says well there have been lots of good reports and you know out there of people who have Fontan and stuff who, you know, are having children. So we're just going to have to keep a really close eye on you and be sure everything's good and all that kind of stuff. So I started seeing him a little bit more. Well, I had gone to an OBGYN who I had been seeing forever. And I told him, you know, well, doctor said it's fine, but I guess he was scared. And he said, no, it's too much of a risk. And he said, maybe it's, I was still early in my pregnancy, maybe not even a month along. And he said, maybe we should try having, you know, and it's probably best if you had an abortion, you know, to abort it right now, because we don't want to put you in that risk. And I so I said, no, you know, no, it's like, you know, I knew what I was getting into when this happened, you know, and I prayed about it. And I guess what I'm going to do is go through it and whatever happens, happens, you know, I'm fine with it. My husband and I had talked about it. And as long as you can save, save the baby, you know, we're fine with it, whatever happens from then on after. So that's how it was. It was kind of scary, but then I had a piece about it too. So it was, it was okay. My parents were very, very worried, but I think I was more at peace about it than, than they were. So. And because of the OBGYN's reaction, did you end up finding a new OBGYN or? No, I actually stuck, stuck with him. Uh, My cardiologist called, well, he called him and they had really good conversations and they had a really good relationship, you know, together figuring out the whole stuff after, you know, after that. So I was able to stay with the same, the same doctor. Oh, good. That's good. I'm glad that he was able to, to be there for you. And for a lot of people, if they get negative feedback from doctors like that, I know that for some it's like, okay, let's go find a new one <laughs> and, and yeah. that work for some people, but I'm glad it worked out for you. Yeah. Yeah. And the good thing is, cause I had been, cause I had always had problems with, you know, with, female problem stuff you know since I was little well not little since I had started my period always been horrible so he was like a he was actually recommended by my cardiologist to go and see him so you know so that's why I stuck with him just because he was recommended you know and I could understand he was scared because he had never had a patient like me before I mean I've had dentists who didn't want to do braces because they were scared you know so yeah (laughs) Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Now I've, I've never had the experience of having a dentist be terrified. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a new one. Bra- 
Yeah, I've had dentists who my dentist did not want to do braces because he said it was too he was too worried about doing them. So wow, <laughs> but wow, interesting. Yeah, that's that's different. I've never heard that one before. <laughs> um, and so you you find out that you're pregnant and you stick with the same OBGYN and what was the monitoring process like for the duration of your pregnancy? Um, I would go to the car. I, I guess it was pretty the same. Um, I would see the OBGYN probably more than most people would um, just to be sure everything was going good. And my cardiologist would just always kept up with me, you know, he would call me and over the phone and just, you know, be sure everything was good and stuff like that. But other than that, um, since I really didn't have any problems, everything was pretty, it seemed pretty normal to me, you know? So I think it was, it was pretty normal with, you know, just keeping in contact with the OBGYN and they were, I think they had a really good relationship together. So it was, it was working out smoothly, you know? So. Gotcha. Okay. So the, the duration of your pregnancy went fairly smoothly and then yeah. were there any, um, complications while delivering? Well, actually complications started, I did start having complications towards the end of my third, like towards the end of my pregnancy. Um, she was supposed to have been born in September, but in August I could, I was saying developing toxemia and stuff like that. And she wasn't growing and struggling and, you know, just pressure was always really high. My legs were really swollen. So the OBGYN and cardiologist said, yeah, maybe it's time to, to deliver. So I had gone in that day just for a regular appointment, you know, didn't think anything of it. And from, it went from a regular appointment to being admitted to the hospital to having her two days later. So, yeah. So, and during the whole, you know, they monitored me at the hospital. They had a monitor over my stomach monitoring, you know, her because they were seeing how she was struggling and all that kind of stuff and trying to keep me, you know, in good, in stable condition because how I was, my legs were getting really swollen. My pressure was always high. So um, there were, I was scheduled for a cesarean two days after I got admitted to the hospital in August. And because I had scoliosis, they could not do a, a um, epidural. So I couldn't have that done. So when I went to surgery, they had to put me under, which was, it was one of the scariest things because I had never, I had never experienced that. You know, I've been put to sleep before, but this was, I guess they do it different than they do there. And I didn't have experienced it differently. So when that happened, I was, I was scared. So during the actual procedure, the C-section, my husband didn't want to go in with me because he was kind of nervous. So my mom went with me and my mom says it was the most scariest experience she had ever been through. Cause she said, as soon as they had delivered my daughter that I had, they had lost all my vitals. I wasn't breathing. They had to take her out of the room and they had to trach and do all that kind of stuff. And that my daughter wasn't breathing, you know, and she said, she just got out of the room. She goes, we had thought we had lost you and, and the baby. We thought it was, it was over. So, but I had a bunch of prayer people in that hospital. I think the, I think my mom said that the room was full, the way it was room of full of family, just praying and praying and praying until finally the doctor came out and said, everything's fine. You know, she's good. The baby's good. You know, I was in ICU for like three or four days. Um, my daughter was in the hospital for like a month. So, wow. so yeah, it was, it was an experience. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. <laughs> so you, so you flatlined. Is that what you're? Oh my God. Yeah, that's from what I understand from what my mom, I was, yeah, but that's from, from the stories I hear it. It said, yeah, they had lost all my vitals and I wasn't breathing or anything like that. So they had to wish to go out of the room and do what they had to do. To, and when I was, after a while, after I got back to a normal room and the doctor was checking my incisions, he says, you really scared us. It's like, and I had my tubes tied that's at the same time. So they were able to get me back to where I needed to be to have the tubes tied because they said we brought, you know, we were able to stabilize you, get everything going. And we tied those tubes to those because we're not going through this again. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, is that because I know to to have tubes tied, you have to like sign paperwork. Did you see? Yeah. It? Okay, you saw. I had signed it before. We had new, yeah, because cardiologist had also said, you know, this one and this this will be this will be it. it was like, okay, I'll be happy with just the one. So okay. as long as I have the one, I'm fine. So yeah, we had signed the papers before that. Okay. 
she was your daughter was in the hospital for you said five months no she, she was in a hospital for a month oh a month a whole, yeah one month okay wow was she born um tiny was she small she was small she weighed three pounds she was little tiny little thing and so why didn't get to take her out of the hospital till she weighed at least four to five pounds so it took her a whole month but yeah she was she was little she had all these tubes and stuff on her I didn't get to see her till the day I got out of the maybe two days before I got out of the hospital just because I was still in ICU and all that kind of stuff so I got to see her maybe two three days later so just seeing all those tubes and stuff I saw pictures she was so tiny and tubes everywhere and stuff so wow so what was it how how did you cope with like knowing that you had had a baby but not being able to see her it was really hard um very depressing very emotional I got to go home and she had to stay so I cried all the way home I cried at home all the time um and at that time I was living with my mom and dad just just so that my mom could help me out with things because I was still very you know still not 100 percent and my husband was staying at our home because he had to go to work every day and all that kind of stuff he really couldn't stay home with me so I was staying with my parents for a while and it was like, okay, every day, mom, take me to the hospital, take me to the hospital. And we live about an hour away. So it was an hour every day. I would go in the morning. I'd stay there till like six, seven o'clock at night and come back home and do it all over again. But I was there. And when I wasn't there, I was on the phone all the time, every hour. How's she doing? How's she doing? So, yeah. And so she, she took a month, she added on the weight and, and it went smoothly. Were there complications for her after birth? Um, she had a small murmur, but it, by the time she was two, it was completely gone. So she, yeah, she, she did well. Um, she grew up, she, you know, healthy as normal, normal baby, you know, nothing, nothing difficult or anything like that. So. And how old is she now? She is 22. Wow. So after you had her, did you have any lingering um, effects on your heart? Actually, maybe for the first couple of weeks, maybe a month or two, it was took a long time to for me, I guess, to actually get back to where I was before. But I think that's because I was my body had gone through a lot of trauma, and I guess you know, so it got it took about two months. But after that, pretty much back to where I was before. You know, no real big difference in anything. I think now that I'm getting older, I think I'm starting to see more you know, like arrhythmias happen a little bit more, you know, sometimes I come home tired from work a little bit more often than I used to, other than that, but I think it not only goes with age, but I'm sure it's part of, you know, being, uh, you know, a heart person too, so, you know, but I've noticed it, and that kind of sometimes raises, I think now that I'm older, I get more worried, you know, about will I be able to see my grandkid grow up, will I be able, you know, I think now more than ever, because before that never phased me, but as I get older, I think it phases me more now where I worry more about it and I go to bed worried more about it. But I just go to bed every night and pray to God that's going to give me another day, you know, and I thank God when I wake up. <laughs> so, Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. No, definitely. There's, there's a whole um, component to just having faith in, in what's coming next and just roll, rolling with it. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. How does it feel to be essentially told when you're you're younger, you know, oh, she might live to be 10 and then, oh, maybe 20. Oh, we don't really know how long she's going to live. And then be told like, well, probably shouldn't have kids. And then you have a kid and now she's 22. How does that, well, what's the emotion that you feel at that point? It's, I don't know, it's amazing. It's just like, because you never think this is going to happen, in your, you know, I always, I guess you can say you can always think about it, but I guess I always hoped, but never realized it. But then now that it's here and it's happening, you know, it's just, it's just awesome. And like I say, I don't think I would be here or my daughter would be here if it weren't for our faith in the grace of God, like I say every day, because that is the only reason why I'm here, why I'm still here, you know, why I have my daughter. I definitely believe that. So. Would you like to share any messages for any other CHD um, adults who are considering having children? Um, yeah, that it, it is possible, you know, don't lose your hope and don't lose your faith, you know, and 
just you just got to be careful and be sure you do what doctors say when you do it you know just follow their their guidance you know when you do get pregnant you know i mean for all means if they say no it's way 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 too risky then don't because i would hate for anyone to you know go by my advice and say well she had it you know then something happened you know because every everybody's different luckily mine's turned out good you know but definitely there is hope out there you can be a parent you know and as long as your doctor and your OBGYN and YN are you know working closely together it's a possibility you just gotta keep the faith and keep the hope <laughs> yeah awesome well thank you so much Virginia is there anything else you wanted to share with everybody um, yeah, well, I had got news a couple of months ago that well, my daughter got married last year after she graduated college in May, and she got married, and I will soon be a grandma next May, so it even gets better from there, so. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Oh, that's so great. I'm so happy for you. So thank you so much, Virginia, for joining us and answering these questions and, and sharing your story. It was so wonderful to speak with you. It was good speaking to you too, and I'm excited for doing this. This is the first time I've ever done anything like this. So kind of nervous, but excited. So thank you for asking me. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, seeing your story, I think will will help a lot of people. So thank you so much. I hope so. Yeah, because I, when I, for, for that, my journey, I was kind of going in blind because I had no one else to, you know, no one else to look, talk to, or no one else to look back and say they had done this, but hopefully this will help, you know, a lot of women out there. So it was good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. You have a great rest of your day and you too.